All right, let's get started. So first, let me welcome you all to the fourth deep dive, deal deep dive live, uh, where we perform an in-depth financial analysis that hopefully does not suck. Uh, this is gonna be the fourth call that we've done. My name is Mitch Messer. I am a senior, senior um, a manager with HomePred Properties. I am physically right now in Clovis, New Mexico. It's about 4.30 here. I've been inside for like the last three days and eager to get outside. But at any rate, uh, I am excited to uh, have this call with you uh, this evening. Uh, I think this will be a great opportunity. This is the first multifamily that we've had a chance to analyze. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, if you are here for all of that, then you're in the right place. Settle in, relax, and let's get started. So we're going to, uh, as we always do, uh, we're going to uh, review the agenda real briefly just so that everybody's on, on board with what this is about and why we're doing it. Um, I do have a few ground rules just to uh, make this go as smoothly as possible. The first is that I ask that you mute yourself until we get to the Q&A section. There'll be plenty of time for you to ask questions. In fact, I encourage you to ask your questions, but please hold them uh, for the Q&A so that I can get through the, the very short presentation first. Um, I ask that you keep up and be prepared uh, because I am going to try my best to call on people, uh, less to embarrass anybody and more just to make sure that you're all awake out there. Um, and I am going to right now pull up the chat so that I can keep an eye on it. Um, if you do me a favor, uh, and we've not done this before, but I know we've got, we've invited folks from all over. If you do me a favor and in the chat, just take a minute and tell me if you, uh, well, actually tell me where you are physically in the country, uh, city and state, and if you're outside of the US uh, country, just so that I can get a sense for who's out there uh, in um, the ether looking at this. Um, and uh, I will, uh, well, let's just, talk about this. Uh, we're going to cover the three phases of deal analysis, um, input verification, goal achievement, deal enhancement, and then we're going to launch into the discussion of the deal. We have a, an exciting guest presenter who's going to walk through this specific deal and we'll get a chance to ask our questions and, and verify our numbers. And, uh, and hopefully we'll all learn something and uh, be better for it. But first, I got to deal with the elephant in the room uh, because this has come up a little bit in the last couple of weeks, and I, I thought it would be a good opportunity here to address this. What the heck is my motivation for hosting this call? Uh, it's a free call. I'm not asking anybody for any money for the call, so why am I doing this? Uh, and I'll let you in on a, on a little secret. The reason why I'm doing this is very straightforward, and it's not entirely altruistic. Uh, I am a real estate investor. I am looking for deals for myself and I work with a bunch of out of state and overseas investors who are looking for great deals in the US. And the way that I do that, given that I'm living in Clovis, New Mexico, population 39,000, is I need JV partners. I need people all over the country who can find great deals and at least for some of those deals, uh, partner with me so that I can do them and we can find ways to sell them to overseas and out of state investors. So this is, in my mind, a training ground for me to develop people with the skills that they'll need to identify great deals and hopefully partner with me. Some of the people on this call already are my JV partners. I know some of you are already working with me on, on JV deals, but that's the bottom line. I'm looking for people who are trying to learn how to identify deals so that we can do deals together. It's just that simple. And the better you are at recognizing deals, the more val valuable you'll be as an investor. And frankly, the more business that I and other investors can do with you. So that's the, the big secret. It, there's no uh, ulterior motive as before. There will be no pitching of deals or product on this call. If you walk away from this call understanding how to analyze a deal better, then that makes me happy because that means you're one step closer to finding yourself great deals and possibly uh, for us to do JV deals together. So hopefully that clears that up. Let's launch into the three phases of deal analysis. Hopefully by now, if you've been with us since the beginning, you know where this is going. The first, phase one, is input verification. It's, 
is simple as garbage in, garbage out. If you feed your analysis erroneous, untested, unverified inputs, then all bets are off. You're lost before you even get started because you'll have no way of, of getting accurate uh, output. So you've got to take the time to understand the main things that go into an analysis. We'll talk about those in a minute. Once you got that down, uh, there is this whole notion of goal achievement. And, I, and I, I haven't really covered this as much as I would like, so I'm gonna to try to cover it now. Uh, and that is as follows. There, is, there are some objectives that you should have. For example, if you're trying to invest for uh, long-term gain, um, uh, long-term cash flow, let's say, then you probably care about monthly cash flow and cash on cash return. And so your goal is a certain cash on cash return. Your goal is a certain uh, cash flow. So your equations, your, your formulas for, for calculating those are how you will determine how you get those numbers. So you'll run the numbers at a certain price and you'll get a certain cash on cash return and a certain cash flow. And if those numbers don't meet your needs, then you've got to start adjusting knobs. And typically the, the main knob that you adjust is how much you can afford to pay. So we'll talk about that in a bit, but that's how that process works. It's a, it's a back and forth. Oh, I, I need 10%. Well, if I drop the price 2000 bucks, I can get 10%. Okay, well, if I do that, this is going to happen. That's the whole point of goal achievement, but it assumes that you have a goal. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then the final step, which is my favorite, is the deal enhancement. Okay, I've got a deal. How can I use my brain to make that deal better? Because, and I've said this to some of you on the call before, it's a whole lot more fun to type into a spreadsheet to, than to swing a hammer or paint a wall. Both are real estate investing. One pays a whole, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole lot more than the other. So <clears throat> for me, I'm much more excited about being able to create uh, creative deal structures that make sense for my seller and money for me and my investors. Uh, and that's a lot more fun for me than, you know, adding an addition to a house, knocking out a wall, although that can be fun, but this is a lot easier to do and a lot more uh, productive. So let's talk about the first phase, input verification. Uh, and I'll, I'll say this up front. I am primarily a buy and hold investor. So for me, I care about rents. I care about putting a tenant into a property and collecting an income stream over time. I'm not primarily a fix and flip, buy it cheap, fix it, sell it at a profit. That is certainly a valid uh, strategy for investing, but the numbers on that are fairly straightforward. It's the standard Mayo formula, where Mayo stands for maximum allowable offer. Typically it's 70% of R minus repairs is what you can afford to pay. That's pretty straightforward. This is a bit more sophisticated because this assumes that you're carrying the property over time. And so you care about things like the fair market rent, the total repairs needed, the property taxes, insurance. You don't care about those things so much when you're doing a fix and flip because you're not holding the property. Uh, you may need insurance just long enough to get the project done, but once it's done, you're gonna sell it to somebody else and they'll have to get insurance for it. Same thing with property taxes. So um, input verification is gonna really be about verifying that you have the right data elements, that you've gone through the trouble of, of determining accurate R fair market rent, repairs, property taxes, and insurance. And we'll talk in specifics as we get to the actual deal. Phase two, we talked about this before, so I'll cover this a little bit faster, is the goal achievement. Uh, there is a mathematical definition of cash flow. There's a mathematical definition of cash on cash return. I didn't invent it. It's, it existed long before I got here. Uh, and anybody can go to Wikipedia and say, how do you calculate cash flow? Or how do you calculate cash on cash return? And it'll tell you, it's a formula. So the important thing is not how to get the formula. The, the important thing is how to use that formula to achieve your goals. Uh, while there's only one formula for cash on cash return, everybody has different objectives. Some people need 10%. Some people are fine with 7%. And there's no right or wrong. It's what you need. If you are satisfied with 7% cash on cash, then that's what you should be investing for. If you desperately need 12%, then that's what you should be investing for. But you need to understand what those are up front so that you can then achieve that goal by adjusting uh, the components of the equation. And then finally, deal enhancement phase three is how we make the deal better. Uh, and there are a variety of ways to do this. This is the, the most loose of the three because this is, this is the art. The, other, the first two phases are, are science. This is art. This is creativity. It's asking questions of the seller. It's a bunch of things that are, that are hard to nail down, but 
uh, we'll hopefully get a chance to talk a little bit about that uh, on this call for, for this specific deal. But, um, but generally speaking, you're trying to maximize your numbers, your financials, uh, provide better service to the seller, give them what they want. Um, for example, if you wanted to do financing, we talked about this last time, some sellers don't want all their money up front at closing. They would much rather have an income stream over time than get a big chunk of money and have to uh, pay a big chunk of taxes on that in that current tax year. Um, and then also there are ways you can minimize risk by structuring the deal creatively. But that's, that's the deal enhancement phase. That's where you go from a great, a, a good deal to a great deal or a great deal to an awesome deal. Uh, and this is in many ways where a few extra minutes thinking can make you a ton of money. So those are the three phases. Uh, this is our subject house for this call. It's a beautiful duplex in St. Louis, Missouri, 4130 and 4132 Botanical Avenue. Uh, there's the description there. Um, I, I loved it the minute I saw it. Uh, it's a very, very uh, attractive home. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, review the numbers for it. And doing that with us is Emmanuel. I hope it's, I'm not mangling the last name, Johannes. And Emmanuel is a member of Bigger Pockets. And I mentioned this last time, I'll mention it again. I strongly, strongly encourage you to use each other as part of your network. That's why I put his Bigger Pockets profile on here. Uh, as of now, you're all part of my network and I'm, all, and I'm a part of all of your networks. And I make a ton of money from my network. My network provides me with information and deals and colleague contacts and, and all that other good stuff. So I would strongly encourage you after the call perhaps to reach out to Emmanuel and congratulate him on, on how wonderful a, a job he did uh, and see how you can work together because that's where the money is made in this business. Uh, so um, we're going to, uh, if you are uh, in front of your, your um, browser and are, are in a position to uh, type in this URL, that'll take you right to the Google Sheet that has uh, the uh, spreadsheet that we're going to review. You can read along or sing along with us as we go through it. I'm going to um, go ahead and click on it, and then I'm going to ask Emmanuel to take over the screen so that we can go through this. So while my thing is loading, I did verify that my internet's faster, so hopefully my sound quality is better than it was last week. I think I'm running at about 40 megabits up link. Um, but Karina, if you can, or Emmanuel, if you can yeah. uh, switch can over. Take over, sure. Um, you have to stop sharing yours oh, real fast. Mitch. Sorry, yes, thank you. <laughs> Forgot. Okay. okay, let's see if this works. Bear with me, everybody. This is my actually first time using Zoom, so. <laughs> can you guys see my screen? Uh, I sure can. Yes, looks great. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, this is um, um, my Excel kind of uh, spreadsheet here. Uh, I'm going to try and, can you see the whole screen? Yep. Oh, wait. Sure okay. Can. All right. So the way my uh, little graph works basically is if you can see the little peach colored tabs here, this is where my uh, data is kind of input. Um, initially, the house was uh, selling for 325, uh, but this is a, a seller's market here, at least in St. Louis. And so um, I was able to get the deal initially by using my agent to use an escalation clause uh, because it, it really seemed like a good deal initially. And I just wanted to kind of get it locked down and then try and negotiate um, after doing a house inspection. So I, I um, submitted something that said, I'll pay 2000 above your highest price, your highest provable price so that they had to show me the, uh, the actual offer. So um, the highest price that they got, I think was 335. I initially offered 337 and um, unfortunately was only able to so far anyway, negotiate down to 335. We're still in the uh, due diligence period. So um, a down payment, I, I I was able to get a, a special type of loan, 15% um, down for a duplex. Actually, usually it's 20 to 25%, but I, I used a physician loan for this. Um, closing costs I calculated online, um, 6,412. Um, now, although the house is built in 1912, it's in pretty good condition. Um, from my house inspection, there were no major concerns uh, regarding any you know, major renovations or repairs that needed to be done. Uh, the electrical had been updated. The roof is um, five years or less old. 
there was some minor tuck pointing. Um, it did have some old knob and tube uh, kind of wiring that had been replaced already. So that was the main thing. Um, cool. Hey, Manuel, uh, can yeah. you walk us through, uh, let's start with phase one. Can you walk us through the inputs that you uh, used to begin doing your analysis, the, your estimations for ARB and rental? Yeah, and that so the ARB was, was very difficult to come up with just because trying to look for a um, similar home, that, you know, a duplex in the same area with the same number of bedrooms and bathrooms, three bedrooms, one bath, each, each side of the duplex. Um, a lot of the, the homes in that Shaw area are single family homes, uh, or they used to be duplexes and have been converted to single family homes. So there was really only uh, one or two properties that I was able to come up with to kind of compare to get a, uh, an estimate. And one was is 3934 Cleveland Ave, which um, is actually a duplex that has um, three bedroom and two bath. Actually, is it, no, it's two bedroom and two bath, two full bath each, each duplex. And that was selling for 339. And in fact, um, I, I really took my ARV from the appraisal that I got since I have it under market. It's, uh, and they, they appraised uh, this property actually at $345,000. Um, so um, yeah, I, that, I had the most difficulty really trying to get an ARV. I'm not sure if any of you were able to, um, you know, to, to do a better job, I'm sure probably. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Does anyone else have any uh, any counter uh, point for uh, for after repair value for this property? Anyone think it would, that his ARV is is off dramatically? No, we're good. Yeah, I I actually okay. got around two eighty. Uh, the this is Kevin, by the way. I got two eighty and. The, I know that's what Zillow was estimating as well. Is that is that where you? How no, you, that's not why I got it. It it was difficult finding um, similar type properties in the area duplexes. Um, I was able to find a few. Uh, it didn't have a lot of information as to how many bedrooms and bathrooms, and 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 all of that. But like based on that information, I got thirty nine sixty nine Cleveland. 42, 43 botanical as, you know, comparative, comparables. And I was getting 280 as the ARP. Okay. Anyone else? Now, Emmanuel, I will say that, that you have the advantage here or an advantage here in that, uh, I mean, no bank is going to loan without doing an appraisal. And so they're going to make absolutely sure that they're not lending you money where the value is way, way off because they don't want to lose. And so you have, it, it is encouraging. Uh, it's not always ironclad, but it's encouraging that the, that the bank's appraisal, you said 345? Yes, $10,000 higher than the purchase price. Yeah, it, that's, that's encouraging. Now, of course, appraisals can be wrong. Uh, we right. saw in 2008 that, you know, up until the, the crash, appraisers were still appraising things at ridiculous values. And then of course it crashed and we all took a bath. So appraisal is not gonna save you, but it, it is at least encouraging to know that two parties, you and the, well, three parties, you, the seller and the bank now are pretty much in agreement about what the value of the property. So that's, yeah. that's encouraging. Okay, so let's, let's assume that it's somewhere in that vicinity, uh, more or less. Um, let's talk about uh, rent because I, I got a, I'm curious to know how you, you came across the, uh, the rent. So uh, the, one of the units is already occupied, um, the lower unit, and um, they pay $1,400 a month rent. Now, initially, I, I found some discrepancies. I, I was using the Rentometer app, but only on my iPhone. So it was the Rentometer Express. I don't mm. know if any of you guys use that. And I just recently today, um, downloaded the free trial of the entire, you know, full rentometer the, when I pulled it up and I got different numbers, uh, interesting enough. So when I first pulled it up on the rentometer express, uh, as a three bedroom, it didn't ask you bathrooms on the app. Um, it came up as like average was 1383. Uh, so 1400 wasn't too off from that. Um, and, but then when I pulled it up on, um, I'm not sure. Can you see my screen here? Yes. So this is the entire full app, which I just kind of did. And 
it, it has lower 75th percentile is like 1275. So the average is more 1,143. Uh, so I found that kind of interesting. Uh, I used another site besides Rentometer. It's called, it's another app called Hot Pads. And mm -hmm. uh, that is able to kind of give you nearby and similar properties as, as much as you can find uh, for rent. So um, it's, you know, since I figured they're already paying 1400 that that's what I would keep it at. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, just uh, just briefly to uh, uh, reach back to Joseph, he mentioned that the R figure is not on the spreadsheet uh, because, and it's not. Uh, it on my spreadsheet it is, but because it doesn't impact the calculations for this, it doesn't have to be here. So we, we're just kind of talking it, talking it out. But um, but three forty five, it sounds like would be what we're estimating the R to be ish based on the appraisal. Um, if this were a fix and flip, then R would, would definitely be very important. But for yeah. a buy and hold, R, R really doesn't factor into the calculations, except for the fact that, again, as I've said before, I like to buy with a little bit of room between what I'm paying and what it's worth, just in case if I had to dump it real fast, there's a little enough room for me to find an agent, get it sold, and not lose my shirt. Um, and so that's, um, that's fair, I think. Uh, but I wanted to talk about renting because um, if you if you ran the if you did look at the rentometer numbers for with uh, one bathroom um, and yours is one bathroom right not one and a half or more. correct it's one um, with one it drops fairly dramatically as I recall um, I did it with one I did a six month lookout instead of a twelve month lookout and I got like so I kind of got scared because I got I saw like and I'm running it now in the background. Uh, oh, six months wasn't enough. Okay, I see what happened here. I did, need to do 12 months. I got like 800 and something. So that I got a little scared uh, and hoped that you had uh, verified it. The fact that, yeah, I got 850 uh, for 12 month uh, with a 3-1. Um, the, the, the danger of basing it on existing tenants, particularly if there's a huge gap between what the existing tenant's paying and fair market is pretty obviously that if the tenant moves out, you're back to to reality, and if you if you can't put right. someone else in there for that same amount, then right. your numbers are gonna are gonna uh, collapse a little bit. Um, if this is a long term tenant that's been in there for years and years and years, you might, you might feel better about about mm -hmm. making that assumption. But if they've all, if the years if the lease hasn't been seasoned for more than you know a few months, then you might want to temper that uh, that rent right. because anything could happen with the tenant, even if they've been there for years, anything could happen. And if they move out and you're back to market, that's going to dramatically impact your numbers. So just be careful about that. Okay. Um, having a lease is great, but it's just a lease and tenants break those all the time. Right. Uh, are the two units upstairs and downstairs, roughly speaking, the same size? Roughly speaking, the upstairs has an additional sunroom above uh, what the kind of outdoor, um, I don't know, the what you call it, porch area in the back is so there's a little bit additional space upstairs than there is downstairs got it so if you if the upstairs is getting 1400 since the downstairs is a little bit smaller would you would you are you still assuming 14 for the downstairs or would you so adjust it? It, it actually it's the downstairs is one is the one that's smaller that's getting 1400 and ah, the, got it. the unique thing I, I i forgot to mention about this is that i'm actually planning and probably that'll probably come in the section three but as far as deal enhancement i'm planning on house hacking that and for those of you who may not be familiar with house hacking, I'm, I'm going to live in the upstairs unit, the unoccupied unit, and rent out uh, the other one. So it kind of makes the deal even better for me in that sense. Got it. Got it. Uh, cool. Um, okay. Uh, you talked, we talked about R, we talked about fair market rent. Let's talk about uh, repairs. You have zero here for repairs. And it looks like they did a, a great job of renovation. It looks like a beautiful. Uh, at least from Zillow, the pictures there were, were pretty stunning. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I was worried just because of the age of the home, but from the uh, house inspection report that I got, it seemed, you know, they were choosing kind of really minor things. There were some areas of minor tuck pointing along the sides of the house. Uh, there were some very small parts of the roof that needed to be kind of redone, but uh, otherwise, uh, you know, the roof it was less than five years old, HVAC, everything was seemed okay. So I didn't know what to put in, and I didn't just want to put a random number in, but I'm sure that, you know, that's definitely something to be prepared for that, that something could break down. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, 
and taxes insurance, I'm, I'm assuming you got, those are either actuals or you got quotes? Yes, uh, the property taxes that I went on to the St. Louis City uh, um, uh, real estate page and got that. The insurance is, is, is a quote I got from Liberty Mutual. Uh, so, and awesome. then the vacancy, vacancy rate I chose just almost basically one month's rent, 7% um, for that. And since I'll be occupying one side, uh, so I, it'll just be one, one side that'll be vacant at that. So, Got it. Uh, someone's asking uh, how you found out about the information about the roof being less than five years old. I assume the seller shared that with you. Or did the seller the, did, the, yeah, as well as the inspector. Uh, inspector confirmed it. Yes. Um, cool. Um, I'll just, I'll point out with respect to property taxes. Uh, I uh, made this observation last year with respect to property taxes. Apparently there was a, there were some counties in Georgia where the property taxes were going up dramatically year over year. And mm -hmm. so my recommendation is always to take a look, not just at the current year's taxes, but a year or two prior previous, just yeah. to see what the trend looks like. Because what you don't want to be shocked by is, you know, next year taxes escalate dramatically and you weren't prepared for it. Right, that's a good point. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, your, your, uh, your taxes, your insurance are good. Uh, vacancy rate is, you know, it's one of those things that everybody has their, their, um, their favorite numbers. It's, it's, it, as long as it's not zero, I'm okay. Um, uh, one out of 12 is actually 8.3%, um, but it's close enough. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that just having some room, some wiggle room in there is going to keep you out of trouble going forward. Um, but it's, it's not a right or wrong. It's just a, it's, it's what the market uh, suggests is going to be likely the case. I don't know anything about the St. Louis market, uh, but in the Metro Atlanta market, for example, Mm -hmm. Rents are holding steady, if not increasing. They had been increasing for a long, long time. We weren't sure what COVID-19 would do. Uh, and we were, I was anxious about what happened in 2008 happening here. I don't think that's going to happen. I think um, the supply of, of, of rental housing in Atlanta now uh, is, is tight. Uh, it was not tight in 2008. There was a huge oversupply of houses. That's not the case now. And so I think rents are going to continue to go up. Uh, so I, I think your uh, vacancy rate is probably reasonable. If you did go vacant, you could probably get it filled fairly quickly. If this were in Atlanta, I mean, again, you'd have to verify this for St. Louis, but, but I think that's, that's wise uh, of you to just be mindful of what the market has to say. Um, so I think from a phase one standpoint, we pretty much got all the basics. Uh, we, we, we're, we at least are all on the same page that we're feeding it information that is, as far as we can tell, the best that's available for us. So let's move on to phase two. Uh, tell us, uh, Emmanuel, what you care about uh, as a, I mean, I mean, I'm maybe leading the witness here, what you care about as a uh, buy and hold investor. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, as far as my cash on, I do care about cash on cash and, 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 uh, and the cash flow, essentially. So the cash on cash that I like to get um, would be at least 10% um, with um, a few hundred dollars, two to three hundred dollars cash flow minimum. So, so okay. um, cool. I'll, I'll look at things. If if there's a property that has some hidden value to it, in the sense that I can um, force appreciate it, meaning I can you know makes a, a storage in the backyard that I can rent or somehow increase the income that comes into the property, then um, I'll look at that. If the cash on cash is lower, maybe nine percent or so, um, you know. Got it. Um, I had a quick question for you, uh, just a brief uh, reference to the property management data. Uh, is the property being professionally managed right now? It is not, no. Okay. Uh, and and um, I, go ahead. And you plan to? I plan to manage, manage it yourself. myself, yeah, especially since I'll be living in it, yes. I, I didn't see the. And I, I'm going to use, uh, I think, Cozy to kind of collect rents online. There, there are these online kind of property management things where when the need arises, um, they can connect you with a handyman or plumber or electrician and such, which are cheaper than the um, typical, you know, 10% uh, property management fees that the companies uh, charge. Yeah, got it. Um, 
for utilities? Is are there some shared utilities that the uh, property has? So I I calculated. Uh, I got this number by um, I went on this app called Nextdoor. I don't know if you, you all are familiar with that, but I went in a sure. specific neighborhood, Shaw neighborhood, and I asked. I I did a poll, and I got a reply of like maybe fifty people uh, who said, you know, I just said, are your property ta- or are your um, utilities you know, $50 to 100, 100 to 150, 150 to 200. And, and all of them said 250 uh, or 200 to 250. So I just chose the higher number there. But I think it's for the entire, most of those homes are single family. So I think that might even be split in half. But I wanted to put the whole, as the owner, I'll be responsible for that. So. Now, is that the way, is that the, the, the I don't know St. Louis tradition. Is that the tradition that you, that the owner cut, pays the utilities for the tenants there? Uh, it, that is not no these are they're metered separately so you know gas and everything they'll be paying their own uh, okay. but I just wanted to put the entire amount just to you know just in case got just it, to be safe it. yeah so if got I change it, it to half here you know it increases the cash on cash a lot but I don't want to look at a rosy picture and say oh that's going to be my cash on cash or you know so got it so um, a couple of questions on the chat uh, uh, someone made a point that uh, if no obvious repairs now this is Joseph uh, they assume a thousand dollars a door. I do the same thing. I, I'll, you'll never see zero re- repairs and renovation. There'll always be something that's got to get fixed. Yeah. Um, and so that's not a bad idea. Uh, Kara asks if you have uh, had the, the P12, basically the profit and loss for the last 12 months for the tenants, uh, mm-hmm. that would help you. Um, and I'll throw this out there. I just I had a question about this on Bigger Pockets earlier today. Uh, there's this, this notion of a stopple. Um, which is uh, the, the process by which you verify all the information from both the tenant and the landlord so that you go into this, because this is pre-existing arrangement, this pre-existing rental agreement between the tenant and the landlord. Yes. Uh, and you're kind of stepping into that. And there are often unspoken understandings and, and, right. and little side, and you want to make sure all that stuff is explicit because once you sign it, all that stuff is on you. And so the estoppel process says, hey, let's verify actual rents for the last 12 months. Let's verify how much these people paid in security deposit. Where is it being stored? Is that being transferred over as part of the closing? So all those little details, are there any side deals between the tenant and the landlord? And you not only ask the, the I mean, yeah, you not only ask the seller this, you have the, the tenant verify this in writing. Um, and so they can't come back later and say, oh, but the, the, the landlord right. promised me he was going to re, re-carpet my entire unit. Well, no, you said that there were no existing arrangements, so right. no, you get no carpet. So the estoppel process will address all of the issues that would come about here. And for us, that's part of the due diligence period. They, they deliver all that information to you. You verify that with the tenant and you move forward. And if you can't get all that information, uh, my suggestion to the person that, that I answered the question to on Bigger Pockets today was you extend out your due diligence because you're not, you don't want to just right. assume everything's okay just because they're not telling you. And I apologize for the background noise. I have people in, my, in the house that are uh, noisy. Anyway, so I just wanted to throw that out there um, that uh, you want to be careful about uh, how you handle understandings from the yes you're all loud out there understanding from between the landlord and the tenant um and i also wanted i'll just i'll give you my i'll try to keep it short my, my one minute lecture on property management um because this is a st louis property so i have i have no stake in this but i will tell you that my number one regret from my entire real estate career i started doing this in 99 is that i managed my properties myself. And I know a lot of you are thinking, well, I want to learn how to do it. I want to understand how it works. That, that, that works for maybe one property, two properties tops, but anything beyond that, and it's costing you and your ability to invest. Um, you can either be a great property manager or you can be a great investor. You can't be both. They are both full-time jobs. And so my recommendation for, uh, particularly for investors just getting started, is budget in the property management, get an excellent property manager, and then watch them like a hawk. In fact, shadow them if you need to, but let them, let someone who knows what they're doing do their thing because learning it the hard way um, is expensive and it's time consuming and you're going to make mistakes that are going to cost you. So you're not going to save any money. Um, So 
uh, again, I'll get off my soapbox, but I, I would just, I would strongly encourage you to not um, assume that property man, doing your own property management is going to save you something, particularly for house hack. The last thing you want is to, frankly, in my opinion, is to have your next door neighbor or your upstairs or downstairs neighbor know that you're the owner. Uh, if I were going to house hack, I would go out of my way to make it look like I'm just another tenant, just like you are, and we're both sending our checks to random management company, even though, of course, the management company works for you. I would not let them know that I'm the owner because you will never get a moment's peace. Uh, they're going to assume that you're made out of money and that all the repairs can be handled because, of course, you're rich because you, you own this property. Right. Um, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that, but, but I would just, I'll strongly encourage you to consider the possibility that property managers, good ones, are worth their weight in gold, and you just can't pick that stuff up overnight. It takes years to get that good. Um, but I, I will leave that alone um, and uh, I'll let you continue. I'll ask you to continue with the phase two, the analysis for the purposes of, of achieving. You said you wanted a minimum of about $200 a month cash flow and a minimum of about 10% cash on cash. Yeah, we just lost. Oh, there you go. Um, so tell us um, if this does it for you, what you had to do to get it to do it for you. Um, talk about your financing a little bit um, and how that plays out and all this. Um, how do yeah. you decide this was a good deal? Um, you know, I just uh, essentially from uh, looking at all the numbers together, um, uh, I was I knew that I had a good deal because I, I was able to, first of all, get a duplex for 15% down. And I was lucky enough to be able to get a physician's loan for that. So I, I knew that if I was able to leverage that, that I would you know, kind of get a higher cash on cash and, and uh, um, cash flow. So, um, and then also just this time where the interest rates are so low, you know, 3.12 uh, uh, interest rate, I felt like, and it was fixed for 30 years. It wasn't an arm where, you know, five years later it was going to change. So I felt like that would be a really good thing as well. Yeah, that's um, a sweet deal. Uh, yeah, so you know, plugging in the numbers, and I guess that's true. I think uh, I, I kind of agree with what you say about the property management. I certainly don't want someone knocking on my door at 3 a.m. saying, "Hey, come fix my, uh, you know, leaky faucet or something like that." So, um, so it, it's it's not a bad idea, in my opinion, just to at least price it, because you may discover that it's not as bad as you think. It'll right. cost you some some cash on cash return. It'll, it'll cost you a point or two on your, but it. In my opinion, it's worth it because you really, truly don't, in my experience, let's put it this way. I did not save any money by doing it myself. And in fact, it, it took me out of being an investor and focused me on being a, a, a landlord. And, you know, you don't want to be a landlord. You want to be focused on your next deal, not the tenants not paying you and dealing with their, their drama. You don't want, frankly, any of that stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, I have a quick question. This is Soli. Um, so... What what type of loan did you use? I don't think I've ever heard of that type of loan. So I'm I'm a physician, a medical doctor's loan, and so uh -huh. a lot of times um, they'll be able to have you put down less of a, a down payment because they feel like you're you're good for it or you're you're able to pay because of your higher salary. So most of the time, actually, um, a physician's loan you can do zero to five percent down, zero down actually, but because of this time with COVID, they're not doing zero down uh, and down payments anymore. Uh, the benefit of a physician's loan is that I don't have to pay PMI, the mortgage insurance. So that's one of the other reasons that I, I chose that. Um, but, but in this scenario, they required me to put at least 15% down to avoid that PMI. Uh, so... Thank you. And, yeah. and these, these aren't banks like BO, you know, Bank of America. These, these aren't the larger banks. These are mostly these... Uh, uh, credit union, smaller uh, mom and pop type banks that, that offer these loans. Yeah, so these are probably portfolio loans that aren't, aren't being sold. They don't need PMI because they're not going to go to the secondary market. That's an awesome deal. Um, are you, are you uh, Emmanuel, currently in, did I hear you say that you're in your due diligence period right now? Yes, correct. So um, we're waiting to uh, hear back for the final underwriting of the loan. And um, so, you know, I, I, I tried to negotiate more off that 335, but they were, they were pretty, they knew they had a good, good deal on their hands. And actually after I came in, um, well, so they say they didn't prove it, but they said they had somebody to offer them 340 for it, but they had already kind of committed and signed with me. So. Got it. 
got it. Um, okay, that's uh, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a sweet loan. Um, I'm I'm happy for you. I'm assuming that there are no hidden gotchas. There's no prepayment penalty. It's uh, no, there's standard no thirty year no. Awesome, that's awesome. Um, and is it a condition that you must? I assume that you must. It's a yes. A, you, a, a you have to owner occupy it. Correct. I, I couldn't do this for a purely investment property. The only reason I was able to get the physician loan was because it was going to be owner occupied. Yeah. Um, uh, and how long does that owner occupancy requirement last? One year only. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So I can move Excellent. out of the year. That's Excellent. Um, okay. So you've got a uh, net operating income of 1776. Uh, how patriotic. Um, <laughs> and let's see here. Um, your expenses, okay, you don't have it, but you, you certainly, we could figure it out if we, if we looked carefully enough. It would be, uh, do you have a- um, Lease, property tax. Is anybody 100 bucks? Total 800 here. Monthly? Okay, monthly, so yeah. 9,600 um, uh, annual taxes. I mean, annual expenses. Um, let's see here, what- uh, so just as a, as a, as a side, um, you might want to uh, take a look for your um, percentage of income for expenses or percentage of expenses for expenses. So for example, to get a sense for what are my, what are my maintenance expenses compared to uh, my total income? What are my utilities compared to my total income? Just so that you can see, Percent. as you look at a, a bunch of deals, you start to see, oh, this particular for example, neighborhood has a very high expense ratio, and this one is much lower expense ratio. Being able to see your expense ratios is helpful, and it's really just you know expenses divided by um, your your income. Uh, and so, uh, if you're uh, gotcha, so add that to the chart, you think would be beneficial? Okay. Yeah, I think it, it couldn't hurt. I mean, it, it, it's one of those things. It 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 only there if it's helping you. Uh, your uh, Someone's asking if you if you're occupying one of the units, wouldn't your gross rental income only be half of the, um, the fourteen hundred? So I'm assuming that you ran the numbers first. Well, I'll, I'll let me say what I do. What I typically do is run the numbers as a cash deal, um, where yes. I'm not living if in I it. Not. Right. It's just a pure investment. Correct. Um, and then, uh, in your case, because your financing requires that you live in it, then you would I would typically have a separate sheet that I would run. That would let me know, yeah, I got to give up some of the um, income. But in that case, for example, I would probably adjust, maybe I, I might adjust my vacancy a little bit. But, but, um, but yeah, I would look at both of those side by side. And because in some cases, the best deal might not be to take this financing. The best deal may be to actually do the deal cash and get a better return and then use that financing that you've got for something else. Right. Um, so it's not a given that just because the financing is great that you should use it on on this deal, that was gonna be my next question. Is, is, is there a financing contingency on your contract or do you have to get this thing closed uh, if you're, whether your financing comes in or not? There is a financing contingency that, uh, you know, obviously to be able to get the, uh, um, the loan and also there's a, a, to be able to get the insurance as well, uh, insurance contingency as well. Is it unlikely that, I mean, is it possible? It is that not you unlikely. I, I, okay. I, I most likely will get it. It's just- uh, You just have it in the contract. The time, right. Okay, that's smart. That's smart. Um, I just wanted it as a way out of the deal in case I, you know, something came up and I saw something during inspection or something that wasn't uh, going to fly. So, got it. Uh, someone's asking about terms, uh, net operating income versus cash flow. Um, they are not the same. Uh, net operating income is going to exclude things like um, mortgage payments. Uh, so, the principal and interest uh, are not. Uh, part of your net operating income, they, they would need to be deducted from their net operating income to get uh, to your cash flow. Um, so uh, in that regard, they're, they're not the, the same. Um, and then once you have cash flow, then uh, that is, uh, we all understand that's, that's, what you, that's what you're gonna, you're spendable at the end of the month or year, you're spendable, um, I hesitate to call it profit, but, but what's left over after all the smoke clears and the dust settles, what you've got in cash. The other thing I, I wanted to point out was, um, I know looking at it like, okay, so you're occupying one of the properties, you're 
um, you know, missing out on that basically rent. But at the same time, it's rent that I almost really don't have to pay because, you know, they're paying my mortgage with their $1,400 a month rent. Uh, I'm living essentially almost for free, um, you know, maybe two, three hundred dollars, but the cash flow would more than cover that. So in that sense, I'm moving from a place that's probably twenty two hundred dollars a month rent to, you know, almost for free. So that's uh, a savings there as well, rent that I don't have to pay. So, yeah, so there's some intangibles that don't show up on a spreadsheet with respect to um, doing a house hack uh, that make it a, a bit more challenging, uh, not challenging, just a bit more um, interesting from the standpoint of calculations, because yes, you would have to live someplace. And if you, if you're, if moving into your, if the only way you can get your financing is to move in, then uh, if the financing is really what you want, then you don't have a choice but to move in uh, and, and house hack it. Um, and so some portion of that rent that you would, that you're losing by being there could be hand waved away because you could argue that you'd have to live someplace and that there'd be right. some expense that you'd have to cough up to, uh, to survive. So, but, but I, I generally like to, uh, I think, I think generally speaking, the, the notion that you, um, if you have great financing, you should use it for house hack. There's an argument to be made for that. Uh, there's also an argument to be made for save that for something that you really want to keep and hold for the long term because there are ways that you can get into deals that don't require a whole lot of money at all. Uh, and so people tend to house hack because they want to get in cheaply. Um, and there are ways to do that that don't necessarily involve banks at all. And we can talk about that on another call. But for the purposes of this, um, I would I typically like to do a side by side, show me what it looks like cash, show me what it looks like as a house hack, and then I kind of make the assessment um, that way. I, I want to pause now because we've been talking about this for a while and I sometimes get the impression that um, some folks either are maybe just barely keeping up but not entirely sure about stuff uh, or they are totally lost and I don't want to lose anybody. So um, again, I, I'd like to believe that we are fairly supportive here. My, my intent is not to to embarrass anybody, but I'll just, and I've said before, I think probably to many of you that sometimes asking, being brave and asking the question that you think is just you um, will, will prove to be the case that a lot of other people have the exact same question. So I wanted to pause here and just ask if anybody had any question about um, how this thing is working, um, how the analysis part works, what the, what the premise is, what the concept is, what the intent is, uh, so that uh, we can move forward knowing that we've got everybody. I don't want to leave anybody behind here. Uh, and, and while you're thinking about that, let me also throw out that um, while I love cash on cash return, it is not the only way to assess an investment. Um, it is a way, uh, and it is certainly, it beats the heck out of, out of the, uh, cap rate, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about cap rate in a second, but um, what we're not taking into account here, for example, is uh, the fact that you're amortizing this thing. Uh, of that 1216 uh, manual, uh, I'm guessing most of it in the first year is going to be uh, interest. Um, yeah. So you're going to get some tax benefit from that because you're going to write some of that stuff off. Absolutely. Um, you're going to get some amortization, not a whole lot, but some amortization. So that's so if you if you really 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 wanted to to analyze this the heck out of this deal, you would not only look at the cash flow, you'd look at the amortization, you'd look at the you look at all of the income streams that are coming to you, you'd um, discount all of those cash flows to come up with a present value. I mean, you do a full blown analysis, um, and so cash flow is not the only way that this thing benefits you. You're hoping, I would imagine. Also, that a year or two down the road, this thing is going to appreciate, and you're going to get some, some, uh, some equity build up here. Um, you're not buying it, hopefully, for that because you, you have no control over that. And yeah. as I've learned the hard way, you cannot eat equity. But if it happens, you're going to benefit from it. So cash flow is just one component of, of the benefits that you're getting from this deal. It would take us a lot longer to run a full-blown analysis of all the potential income streams, but cash flow is one. 
Um, and um, um, I did want to want to just point out that 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 that's not the only benefit here. Um, let me just talk, I talked about it the last call. I think I'll talk about it again. Uh, cap rate. Um, cap rate. Think if, if for those of you who are familiar with the stock world, uh, cap rate is basically an inverse price earnings ratio. Doesn't tell you whether or not it's a good investment. Uh, it's intended to be used with respect to a sector. So you'll say uh, a tech stock should be trading at about this much of a PE ratio. Um, or a utility stock might be trading at that much of a PE ratio. And so if you had a tech stock and you, and you were way outside of the range of that PE ratio, it might raise some eyebrows. People would wonder, why are you trading at you know, a much higher PE ratio than, than everything else in your sector? It does not tell you anything about whether it's a good investment or not. Um, and so, because it, it, it can't. Um, um, and so I, when people speak about cap rate with respect to real estate, they're really talking about asset classes. So for, you know, when you're talking apartment complexes in St. Louis, Missouri, in a particular neighborhood, you might say most of the apartment complexes or the, the, this area has a, an average cap rate of about this, uh, or that area has a cap rate of about that. It's really not useful to talk about a specific house's cap rate. Uh, you can calculate it. I mean, the math is there, but it, it doesn't help you know anything um, about the, um, the actual investment. Cap rate, net operating income, and purchase price. There's no repairs in there. There's no, uh, exp no oh, their expenses are in there, implied in there, but there's no financing in there. There's a lot of stuff that's missing and you can't just hand wave that stuff. I mean, it, it's dangerous to, to get focused on cap rate. Uh, and in fact, I think in the very first call, uh, there was a, a, a bigger pockets blog post that I posted. It wasn't one of mine, but they, the author made a very compelling point about why cap rate should not be used to assess an investment. It's really just a ratio. It's a, it's a shorthand ratio that kind of tells you for commercial real estate, where you are in the, in the ecosphere with respect to uh, location geography um, for, for houses, for single family houses, it really means next to nothing. It's not less than nothing. It's just a, it, it's, it's easily calculable, but it's, it's very, very misleading and not partic particularly helpful. Um, I believe cash on cash is far more helpful, and not the only metric, but a far more helpful uh, metric. Um, I don't see any, any questions in the chat, um, and I do want to make sure that we spend a little bit of time talking about phase three, because we don't often get a chance to spend a lot of time on that. So I, um, if no one has any questions about the calculations part. Um, Mitch, I actually do have one question. Uh, it's, it's a sure. quick one. Though. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Dave. Uh, this is my first call. Thanks for having me. Uh, my question is this. Welcome. So when I ran some of the numbers, um, I came up uh, just the gross, you know, when you're talking about the rent income, um, I came up with about $700 um, shy of what you did. Um, I'm just curious what, you know, why, what level of disparity is, is uh, acceptable when you're when you're running some of these numbers. Uh, that's a fair question. So when I if I see if someone had come on the call and and said what she just said that there's that that much of disparity, I'd want to dive deeper and figure out what I'm not seeing because, um, and, and Emmanuel's point was that if the downstairs and I, hopefully I get this right, Emmanuel, if the downstairs is smaller and getting fourteen hundred. Well, they're both really large. They're both sixteen hundred, one thousand six hundred and fifty. Uh, you know, square feet. So they're both pretty big places. And then that might be part of it why, you know, you may have a two or three one that's cheaper, but, but it's a huge space, you know, so that's part of it. And I, I think more than that, it's just the location is an extremely kind of trendy place to be. It's right in the middle of the city and, and a really desired neighborhood. There's a huge university medical system right around the corner. It's close yep. to all the highway. So that's part of it. I don't think it's so much the, uh, the home amenities, but... So you're saving about 1,400 each for the top and bottom? 1,600, 1,650 approximately. The, the bottom one might be maybe a little less, uh, but um, maybe just about 1,600, but- Got it. Yeah. Got it, okay. Um, so, so I asked because your uh, gross rental income is 2,800, so I'm assuming- yeah. 
I, I didn't. I just split them in the middle and said, okay, if, if I move down, I'll, I'll charge the same rent for upstairs. But you yeah, know. got it, got it. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, Dave. That's where he got the. He's assuming fourteen hundred, roughly speaking, fourteen hundred ish, uh, top and bottom, or top and also for bottom, uh, to get about twenty eight hundred. I would probably, if I if I if I thought that there was a potential for discrepancy, as I've said before, the gold standard is let me talk to a property manager that's rented something in that neighborhood in the last 24, well, the last couple of days, and they'll tell me if in fact we're on track or if I'm way, way, way off. Got it. Awesome. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Hi, Mitch. Um, yes. This is, this is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Hi. Hi, everyone. I've spoken to a real estate agent in the St. Louis, Missouri area, and his rent is on par, she said it was 1,200 per unit, so 2,400. Yeah, uh, and so if it's anything, and again, I, I'm not an expert at all in St. Louis. We've, we've had deals in Missouri, but I'm far from an expert. But I would want to, if it's like Atlanta, uh, it is very neighborhood dependent. You could have two neighborhoods a mile away from each other, one getting for the exact same style house, you know, 1400, the other one's getting 2000. So I'd want to dig, dive deeper and find out, you know, let me give you the address. or let me give you the zip code and tell me uh, where you had properties that were 11 or 12 or whatever, where your properties were with respect to this one. Uh, and I want to map it um, again, because I'm a buy and hold investor. I care a lot about rents and that's one input that you've got to get right. You, you do not want to be guessing on that because if it, if you're off, even by a couple hundred, even by a hundred bucks, it's going to dramatically kill your cash and cash return. So you, you'll want to keep digging on the rent until you know for a fact that you can get what you say you're going to get. Um, and the best way to do that, in my opinion, is the absolute best is to have the house next door or down the street have rented like last week for, a, for that same amount of money and then for the exact same house. Then you know that you, you've got, you hit it right on, on the head too far away and you could cross a major boundary and not realize it. Uh, a street where one side of the street is the good side and the other side is the bad side and you may not know that you crossed the boundary and rents drop precipitously and, and you wouldn't know it until you started trying to rent yours. So uh, I, I do spend the extra time and effort. If you're going to spend it any place, that's where you want to spend it, making sure that, you, that you've got the rent right because getting that wrong will sink you. Uh, and property managers are good for that. That's what they, they've got the data uh, because they're filling properties all over the city. And so you can ask somebody, tell me what your experience is with this neighborhood and they'll tell you. Uh, there's no reason for them not to. Um, so let's uh, move on to phase three. Uh, and I, I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about what might make this deal, uh, which is not just price, but this deal more appealing. It sounds like um, Emmanuel, you've got, you've protected yourself with some good contingencies uh, for financing, for uh, insurance. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing you're past, maybe not. Are you past the due diligence period or are you, are you still in due diligence? I think I asked you this. You're still in due diligence, correct? Yeah, still in due diligence. Okay. Um, so, but your inspection's been done. You're pretty confident that, that there aren't any hidden gotchas. Correct. Um, you would, presumably, you'd verify your, uh, the, the landlord tenant stuff by yes, uh, I'm requiring to do yeah. yep, to stop it. Um, I will throw out this out uh, and it's, it, it may not be relevant here, but I've, I've, we've done this before and, and to our amazement have discovered that this is a great way to uh, create some opportunities is to, if you can ask the seller and even this may not be relevant in this case, but I always try to ask the seller what they're going to do with the money. And I don't typically say it like that. Oh, what are you going to do with the money? But we'll say, oh, what's your, what's your plan? Once you, once you get this thing closed, you know, what are you going to do? And see if they say, oh, I'm going to take all this money and go buy a big old property in wherever, or I'm going to buy a boat. Um, because sometimes they'll say, eh, I'm just going to stick it in the bank and sit on it for, yeah. and hey, figure out what well, my next move is. and pick up your stuff, please. <laughs> what, your, what our next uh, investment's going to be. And when you hear that, just as an aside, Remember, think about me, or at least think about, about owner financing and think, gosh, this person doesn't need all their money right now. And if they're going sit to it, stick it in a bank and earn what are, whatever banks are paying, 0.3% or whatever, 
might they not be willing to leave some of that equity in place, let you pay that over time at a better rate than what they're going to get from a bank. Uh, mm -hmm. That, just as an aside, now just, this is a, I guess this is a pro tip, this, this is just a uh, uh, me talking, that's how you, you sideways step into seller financing slash owner financing, is you, you talk to the seller about what they're planning to do once they get this thing closed, and if they don't have all these um, uh, elaborate plans for the proceeds, maybe they don't need all that money right now. And if they don't need all that money right now, maybe they're willing to let you pay it to them over time. And if they're letting you pay it over time, it dramatically reduces your out of pocket, which dramatically increases your cash on cash because you have to put up less cash to get the deal done. So generally speaking, as, as a part of any deal, when I'm talking to a seller, it, it may, it, when you first ask it, it makes you feel a little bit nosy, but truth of the matter is there's no downside. If you ask it the right way, They'll happily tell you. I mean, if they're going to go off and buy a big, beautiful boat, then they'll tell you how great a boat it is and, and the, the make and model, and you can talk about boats. But if every now and then, and more often than not, you'll get someone who says, eh, I don't really have any plans for it. I'm not, I don't really need it for my next property. I'm just going to take it out, stick it in the bank, and, and figure out my next move. Then you should immediately start thinking, well, gosh, how can we help them? How can we help them and help ourselves by structuring a deal that perhaps doesn't pay all that money up front, but pays it out over time uh, in a way that benefits them uh, and benefits you. Uh, so that is an example of a phase three strategy that costs you nothing. It's just one extra question. Uh, and if they have a plan for it, no harm done, you just move on. And if they don't have a plan for it, then you can at least test the waters of um, the alternatives to paying all their equity up front. And Mitch, can I ask a question about that? It, doesn't that doesn't that also benefit them in the sense that if you you know they just agree to seller financing, that they end up maybe not paying as much taxes as getting all that money at once, and that yeah. doesn't benefit them. So if you if you pay them over time, anything um, anything that pays them extends over a year or more, it becomes an installment sale from the, from the standpoint of, of the IRS, uh, which has much more favorable tax treatment than getting hit um, in that current. A year. You could spread out the payments over time in such a way that they minimize, uh, greatly minimize their, their tax uh, footprint. You'd need to talk to their accountant and work out the logistics. But yeah, at least knowing that that's an option is worth discussing. And so many investors I talk to uh, don't ask the question. And to my mind, it, it's, it's a free question. It's a, it's a freebie just to find out if there's any interest. If they say, nope, I've got plans for it, then you can move on to something else. But more often than, I shouldn't say more often than not, at least one out of every 10 times, they don't have any massive, massive plans for the money and they are concerned about potentially uh, taxes, uh, particularly for rental property. If you're buying from an owner occupant, they typically have a plan for the money. But if you're buying from someone who's got a bunch of rental property that they're, that they're cashing off to go sit on a beach someplace, then they may like the idea of getting an income stream over the next 10, 20, 30 years guaranteed uh, that doesn't require them having to chase after a tenant. And so many of the owner finance deals we've struck have been just from that one question, just asking them what their plan is to do with the money um, and in, in such a way that gives them the flexibility to tell us the truth. I mean, there's no reason for them not to. Uh, and once we hear that, we can start to structure, again, this is the you know, you can either swing a hammer or you can type in a spreadsheet, but it's a lot more profitable to type in a spreadsheet. And in five minutes of conversation, you could potentially craft a deal that get, buys you five, 10, 15 points on your cash on cash return because you don't have to pay a big chunk of money up front. You can just pay it out over time and frankly, let your tenant cover the expense um, uh, of uh, buying the, the property. Does that make sense? Uh, now, I will say this. Uh, I have, uh, I started out my investing in Georgia. Uh, Georgia is a wonderful place to be a landlord and a wonderful place to be a property owner. So um, from, from the seller's standpoint, owner financing is a lot less scary in a place like Georgia because I know that if, if you don't pay me in Georgia uh, and I'm your lender, I can get that property back in like a month, month and a half tops. I can foreclose on you in a month and have the property back in less than a month after that. So uh, Georgia has very strong um, pro lender and pro landlord laws. That's not true for every single state. That's not true, for example, in New York. It's not true in California. So the owner financing angle that I'm talking about here, this the seller financing angle, uh, they're the same thing. 
um, make sense in areas where you can protect the seller and they don't have to worry about having to chase after you if you stop making payments. Um, so yes, in Georgia, that's true. In most of the Southern states, that's true. Uh, it's not true everywhere. In Texas, it's true. Texas is also very uh, lender and landlord friendly, um, but that's not true for every place. So you need to check the, the, the laws uh, of your state. Um, but yeah, when, 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 when I'm the lender and, and the, and the um, holder of my note stops paying me in Georgia, in fact, we had one of these last year, uh, the, the uh, tenant stopped paying, we foreclosed in a month and change and they were, we got the property back, we sold it to somebody else and we, we kept, on, uh, kept on moving. Um, I'm trying to, to check the chat to make sure that we, because some people are asking some questions. Um, while I'm doing that, Emmanuel, anything else you want to talk about with respect to this deal? Um, and I think we covered a lot of it, um, unless there are any other specific questions that anybody else had. Hey, this is Sully again. Um, I know someone asked this question earlier, but I think they were asking if this was your first deal or not. I was just curious. I don't know if you covered it or not. Yes, this, this is my first deal. Awesome. That's perfect. Ah, okay. So I'm not going to hit this hard. Someone's asking just uh, as an aside, why someone would want to do seller financing. Um, and I'll, I'll just say this, the short version of that is a variety of reasons. The one that, that we gave a few minutes ago is, is often a valid one, which is that if you, let's say, you know, you've had a really good two th or a really interesting 2020 and you don't want to have a, a huge tax uh, uh, hit this year. You don't want to have a bunch of income hit your taxes, uh, your tax return this year. You'd prefer to have it hit next year. Well, if I can uh, set it up, set up financing so that you pay me some chunk of my equity next year instead of this year, then that benefits me because if it, if it minimizes my tax liability, that's a good thing for me. It's a good thing for, it's a good thing for them, I should say, for the seller. It's a good thing for me as the investor because it gives me a year um, of having to pay that whatever that chunk of money is, I can, I can delay that payment for a year. Uh, and so that's beneficial to me. Money later is worth less to me than money right now. And so there's some benefit to me to delay, to defer those payments. And so that's an example where the seller would love to uh, be able to talk to you about structuring financing that doesn't pay it all up front. Uh, it's not a question of you know, good or bad. It's what the seller needs. But my, my only point in bringing this up is that if you don't ask, no seller is going to volunteer. Hey, you know what? I, I, I just, I'd be just as soon, just as happy as if you paid my, paid my equity over time. Rarely, never is that going to happen. The only way that it's going to be raised as an issue is if you ask it. And so my point is ask it, get into the, get into the position, get comfortable with the idea of just asking, casually asking what they're going to do with the proceeds in a way that's not threatening and not, not, not slimy. Um, and, um, and they'll tell you. Uh, and if they, if they do have plans for it, then, then no harm, no foul, you can move on. But if they don't have specific plans and, it, and there's a possibility that they may see some benefit in getting an income stream over time as opposed to getting a lump sum. I mean, it's kind of like when you, when you win the lottery, you can take the lump sum or you can take the payments. Uh, some people take the lump sum, some people take the payments. It depends on what your situation is. Uh, but once you've decided to take the payments, if later on you want to get a lump sum, there are companies that will give you a lump sum based on how many payments you've got left. There's a whole business behind that. Uh, and so my, my point is not that it's good or bad. My point is get into the habit of asking the question because it, it can't hurt you at all. You can always choose not to do the owner financing. They're not going to make you pay them over time. But if you ask the question, you will often be surprised that they are willing to entertain um, a, some sort of a, of a structured overtime payout as opposed to getting it all at closing. Um, someone's asking about, well, first of all, Emmanuel, people are congratulating you on an excellent job and I will, I will echo that. Uh, this is a very well laid out spreadsheet. It's very easy to use. Uh, I made a couple of suggestions about how it might be more useful, but the important thing is that it's, it, it, it lets you quickly get the information that you need into it and the information that you need out of it. So that's the whole point of it. It doesn't have to be what I need, it's what you need. Um, and so congratulations on doing a great job of organizing this. Um, Appreciate it, thank you. Uh, I, I will ask for those of you who are on the call, looks like we still have a pretty good number of people. Um, I know I talk fast. I know I try to cover this <laughs> stuff quickly because I'm trying to honor people's time and I don't want this to drag on. But uh, while we haven't set up a formal poll, I'm going to 
throw Karina's email under the bus and say, if you would do me a, a favor and shoot her an email telling us either Mitch is talking too fast and I'm not getting any of this stuff and he needs to slow the heck down or I'm getting something out of this and this is valuable for me and useful for me and, and you guys are on the right track. I don't need, I'm not looking for my ego to get stroked. I'm trying to make sure that we're hitting the mark here because again, this is not intended to be entertainment. I'm doing this because I'm hoping you guys are getting something out of it. If you're not, then you know we can certainly stop this, but I need you to tell me if you're getting what you need out of this. And if you're not, let's make the adjustments so that you get it because uh, I'll do this with two people on the call. Uh, it's not the number of people that are on here, but I want to make sure that what I'm giving is of value. So if you would, her email is, sorry, Karina, it's Karina, Karina D at home-pride.com. Uh, you can just shoot her a quick email and let her know. Uh, maybe in the headline, you could put something like, you know, DDD number four, so that she knows what the, uh, the topic is. But uh, just give us some feedback as to whether we're hitting the mark or we're I'm talking too fast or we're covering things too quickly. Um, I, my intent is not to scare people off from, from getting started. I'm doing this because I want people to get up to speed because this to me is the, the critical skill, one of the critical skills in being an investor. Once you can do this, once you can look at a deal and on your own decide it is or is not a good deal, you're halfway there. And as long as you, until you can do that, you're always gonna be afraid, you're always gonna be uh, uncertain and anxious because you're not going to know if you're doing doing the right thing. Um, the ah yes, I will put the email in the chat. Or actually, I'll, let's see if I can do it. Karina. But I apologize, Karina. Home-pride.com. Um, so that's the that's her email. Uh, you can email to her. Uh, also, if you do have a desire to present, I think we have presenters for the next couple of calls but there's still a couple of calls toward the end that we'd like to fill. So if you have a deal that you want to present, please also email her, uh, let her know that, <laughs> let her know that, uh, um, hey, getting the ego strike is not a bad thing. Um, but but you know, if you want to volunteer, make sure that you email her, because again, if you email me, it's going to get lost and, and, and fumbled. Um, I think we're at the hour and 15 minute mark, so I still haven't been able to keep this under an hour. Um, but I hope this was valuable for you all. Uh, I enjoy doing these and um, I will do them as long as um, there's a desire on your part to do them or my birthday comes, whichever comes first. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there will be a call, of course, next week. Uh, we've already got a presenter scheduled. I'll send out the link, uh, but you can probably guess from this, this month's link, this week's link, what it's going to be is going to be bit.ly slash ddd june 11 um and um with that i will thank thank you all for showing up and uh participating and uh i'm looking forward to having this call next week do reach out to emmanuel on bigger pockets and make him part of your network he's obviously a, a sharp guy doing great stuff and uh I, I congratulate you all for taking an hour to get better and stronger and faster